Greetings, minions. It is I, the Flaming Monocle, and I'm here once again with my very, very good friend, T-Dude. Hello. And we're here playing the 39 Steps again. Hopefully a little longer than 15 minutes if you're lucky, but, uh, hey, you're not paying for it, so what the heck? You get what you deserve, people. Exactly. We're doing this for your pleasure and our pleasure. And anyway, <clears throat> should yes. we move on? The next yes. episode, The Radical Candidate. Sir Harry's pickle turns out to Harry's advantage as he makes friends in high places. Sir Harry's pickle? Sir Harry's pickle. This sounds like something the Queen would have something to do with. Yeah. Oh, the Masonic Hall in Brattleburn. Brattleburn. Sounds nice. Welcome to Masonic Hall. Okay. This looks thoroughly modern. Oh, this looks thoroughly Germanic. When something gonna okay. okay. Uh. Car pulls up. Some kind of initi an initiation gonna happen or something. Yeah. Well they haven't bought any goats. Ah. Uh. My word, it is a Masonic call. The hall had about five hundred in it. Women mostly. A lot of bald heads and a dozen or two young men. <laughs> I don't see many bald women these days. The chairman was a no. measly minister with a reddish nose. He lamented on the Crumpleton absence, soliloquised on his influenza, and gave me a certificate as a trusted leader of Australian thought. There were two policemen at the door, and I hope they looked, they took note of that testimonial. <laughs> you, sir, I'll have thoroughly Australian thoughts. <laughs> Good eye. Then Sir Harry started. <laughs> Sir Harry's speech. Uh, all in all. We need to do something about those bloody sharks. <laughs> in a queer way, I like the speech. You can see the niceness of the chap shining out behind the muck with which he'd been spoon fed. <laughs> <laughs> he had about him a bushel of notes from which he read. And when he let go of them, he fell into one prolonged stutter. Every now and then, he remembered a phrase he'd learned by heart. Straightening his back, he gave it off like Henry Irving. The next moment, he was bent double and crooning over his papers. I think I better do it normal. I'm gonna just literally upset just do a normal, do a normal under. scared Scottish voice. Yes. <laughs> he talked about the German menace and said Ooh. it was all a Tory invention to cheat the poor of the rights and keep back the great flood of social reform. But that organised labour realised this and laughed the Tories to scorn. I love this picture. This is like a Spike Milligan uh, drawing of a car right here. <laughs> Cheating the poor of their rights. <laughs> love it. Uh, British Navy. He was all for reducing our Navy as a proof of our good faith and then sending Germany an ultimatum telling her to do the same or we'd knock her into a cocked hat. Reduce Navy. Tick. Prove good faith. <laughs> tick. Boat? I'm going, to, I'm going to knock you back into a cocked hat. <laughs> I love some of these notes where there's literally like a, a, a terribly drawn anchor and there's a cross through it as if to say, Navy? No. Germany no Navy. Automated. <laughs> Especially no anchors. Don't like any anchors. They're all a bunch of anchors. <laughs> Without Boris. Is that Boris? Tories. Okay. He no. said that for the Tories, Germany and Britain would be fellow workers in peace and reform. I thought of the little black book in my pocket. A giddy lot Scudder's friends cared for peace and reform. I probably read that very wrong indeed. Uh, doesn't matter. Uh, okay, cool. So he was a nice dude, but really not getting anywhere, as far as I can tell. I might, yeah, I mightn't be much of an orator, but I was a thousand percent better than Sir Harry. I simply told them all I could remember about Australia, all about its Labour Party and immigration and universal service, praying there should be no Australian there. I doubt if I remembered to mention free trade, but I said there were no Tories in Australia, only Labour and Liberals. And I started in to tell them the kind of glorious business I thought could be made out of the Empire if we really put our backs into it. And everyone clapped at me. 
The the important thing, by the way, um, to take away from this is the fact that um, Sir Harry is a bit is a bit of a obviously nice, lispy, naive yes politician wannabe, but almost stupidly, Hannay is much better. Yes. And um, he needs to keep a low profile, but it's helping him understand what the world is kind of like at right now. I see. Um, because of what's going to happen. Altogether, I fancy I was rather a success. <laughs> Not what I wanted at all. The minister didn't <laughs> like me, though. It was the Australian. I'd like to propose a vote of thanks to Sir Harry for his statesmanlike speech. And to Mr Twisden whose words have the eloquence of an emigration agent. Oh. Ooh. Well, well sod you. Shots fired. <laughs> A ripping speech, Tristan. Now, you're coming home with me. I'm all alone, and if you'll stop a day or two, I'll show you some very decent fishing. <laughs> okay, as we clambered into his. You're coming home with me. I'm, I'm, I'm all alone. And <laughs> you know, I need a companion, and no, oh, what not? And you'll be a ribbon uh, partner. I'll, I'll teach you fishing. <laughs> Back at Sir Harry's, we had a hot supper and drank grog. Oh, the time had come for me to put my cards on the table. I saw by this man's eye that he was the kind you could trust. <laughs> English. Listen, that's Sir a bit Harry, close. You're standing. I have something. Pretty important to say to you. Get away from me. You're a good fellow, and I'm going to be frank. Where on earth did you get that poisonous rubbish you talked tonight? Oh, was it as bad as that? It did sound rather thin. I got most of it out of the progressive magazine and pamphlets that agent chap of mine keeps sending me. But you surely don't think Germany would ever go to war with us? Ask that question in six weeks, and it won't need an answer. See what if you I mean give me your naive. attention for half an hour, mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> Any time today. I blinked no detail. It's called The 39 Steps. Oh, yeah. So you see, cuddled up with him. You have got here in your house the man that is 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 Your duty is to send your car for the police and give me up. I don't think I'll get very far. There'll be an accident, and I'll have a knife in my ribs an hour or so after arrest. Mm. Nevertheless, it's your duty as a law-abiding citizen. Perhaps in a month's time you'll be sorry, but you have no cause to think of that. He was looking at me with bright, steady eyes. What was your job in Rhodesia, Mr Hannay? Mining engineer. I've made my pile cleanly, and I've had a good time in the making of it. Not the profession that weakens the nerves, is it? (laughs) As to that, my nerves are good enough. Mm. Hmm. Here's a picture of a knife. It is is a knife. You took the knife. (laughs) I took the hunting knife and did the old Mashona trick of tossing it in the air and catching it in my lips. Bloody hell. Oh. <laughs> I don't want proof. <laughs> oh. I may be an ass on the platform, but I can size up a man. You're no murderer, and you're no fool. I believe you're speaking the truth. I'm going to back you up. Now, what can I do? First, I want you to write a letter to your uncle. I've got to get in touch with the government people sometime before the 15th of June. Mm. He pulled his moustache. This is foreign office business. <laughs> he my pulled his moustache off. Besides, you'd never convince him. No. I'll go one better. I'll write to the permanent secretary at the foreign office. He's my godfather and one of the best going. Now, what do you want? Bloody hell, he's got people in high places. Yeah, he doesn't use them very well, though. I guess. <laughs> he sat down at a table and wrote to my dictation. Hello, God Dad. How's it going? Uh, <laughs> bloop, bloop, bloop. Oh, jeez. No. Oh, well. Dear waiter. Dear waiter, I hope this letter finds yum well. And I must apologise for not belly and touch fur being a lousy while. 
I've been fiddling all my time, taken up with political obedness. Even to the dentist of my fishing. Anyway, on to more (laughs) impotent matters. Without Saunders overly enigmatic, I'm writing, I say, that if a man called Twisden happens to cake your acquaintance before the 15th of June, this year it would be to your benefit to treat him bindly. Despite what I may lock like this Tuscan chap will prove his benevolence by pissing the words Blade Stacken and fistlingly Annie Loris. Listen carefully to him, dear Funkel. He has to to say to say that might fort wake you up. Cheerio and happy Christmas, Harvey. <laughs> I suppose I'm really <laughs> Cheerio, happy Tuesday. <laughs> I'm just going to quickly just run through this so people can pause it and read the real yes. thing because I'm sure you could actually read it. So. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I hope you'll have enjoyed that. <clears throat> Back. Good. That's the proper style. Oh, by the way, you find my godfather, his name's Sir Walter Bullivant, down at his country cottage for Whitsuntide. It's close to Artenswell on the Kennet. And that's done. Now, what's the next thing? You're about my height. Lend me the oldest tweed suit you've got. Anything will do, so long as the colour is the opposite of the clothes I destroyed this afternoon. Then, show me a map of the neighbourhood and explain to me the lie of the land. Lastly, if the police come seeking me, just show them the car in the glen. If the other lot turn up, tell them I caught the South Express after your meeting. Mm. Dodgy, dodgy, now, dodgy. Y- you should, no, you should wear exactly what you wore previous. That They'd never suspect that. <laughs> he did, or promised to do, all of these things. I shaved off the remnants of my moustache and got inside an ancient suit of what I believe is called heather mixture. Sounds like something that um, one would smoke illicitly. Hmm. The, the map gave me some notion of my whereabouts and told me the two things I wanted to know. Where the main railway was to the south could be joined and what were the wildest district near at, what were the wildest districts near at hand. Big R. It's all wild. <laughs> he wakened me from my slumbers in the smoking room armchair and led me blinking into the dark starry night. I don't want you here anymore. Piss off. <laughs> Listen, I need to just take you to the tool shed very quickly. It's where we keep the bathroom. An old bicycle was found in a tool shed and handed over to me. First, turn to the right, up by the long firwood. By daybreak, you'll be well into the hills. Then, I should pitch the machine into a bog and take to the moors on foot. You can put in a week among the shepherds and be as safe as if you were in New Guinea. Thank you. Think nothing of it. You got me out of a tight spot last night. Now, you better get cracking. Good luck. The hills <clears throat> are alive with the sound of fugitives. Squeak, squeak, squeak. <laughs> I pedalled dil- diligently up steep roads of hill gravel till the skies grew pale with morning. Run to the hills. New, new event, achievement unlocked. <laughs> and that's the end of that chapter. Dum, dum, dum. So really, he's, um, he's, got a, he's, had, he's met a couple of really good people. And uh, he's um, basically, he's still running away, effectively. And, but he's managed to make a communication with the permanent secretary of the foreign office. Um... T- I guess so. Well, yeah, that's what I'm guessing. Yeah. So, he seems to be... Things are all coming up uh, Hannay at the moment. I'm wondering yeah. if there's going to be something bad happening around the corner, maybe. I've never... Uh, for those of you who don't remember or haven't watched the earlier episodes, I've never read The 39 Steps, I've never watched the films, and I've never seen the stage play. Uh, t Dude has seen the stage play. So he yes. has a notion of what is going to be happening around the corner, but he is reluctant to tell me, and equally I'm not about to you know, press him for such things. 
So I do hope. Well, no, and also it was quite a while ago, and it was of it was a kind of a farcical adaptation, but it was true true to the original story nonetheless. So, so in far, a way, I'm so, being yeah. reminded of what's going on. So what you've seen so far is at least running into time with what you've seen. Yep, as in Scudder, it's dead. Milkman is in jail, <laughs> which Sounds is great. ruining. We're ruining a lot of really innocent people's lives here, but it's all in. Uh, it's all to do with a well, nice mystery. War. Yes, to stop the war, you know, which is pretty noble. Yeah, even though because we know the outcome, but it's um, but it's a nice sort of preamble kind of mystery, you know. It's it's good. Well, also, yeah, it's about the the death of the. the yeah, you know, it's about being framed for the death of um, Scudder. Yes. Yes. Cool. Right. Or at least well, he's got he's got that to worry about as well. Oh jeez, yes. <laughs> yeah. This is why things need to c- come up. Here. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> Let's go into the next episode. I do hope you'll join us then, minions. The next time we play the Thirty Nine Steps. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Do join us then. Anything you'd like to say before we finish, to you, dude? No, apart from keep on following the mystery. Oh, you're about to say keep on trucking. To that, keep, I say, on keep on trucking. trucking. Bye. Bye.